here, participants. My name is Sebastian Kubas. I am a constitutional legal scholar. And in this paper, I'd like to examine briefly the relationship between the Christian right and the US Supreme Court. This is a shortened version, a longer PDF file with all the references should also be available. The interconnection between religion and power is as old as the civilization as we know it. James W. Lane in his book on meta religion shows that in many cultures, religion is a constituent of the world building process, often the most important constituent. So religion is engaged in struggles for power. The importance of religion in the United States remains a topic of ongoing scholarly interest both in the US and abroad. Dr. Paulina Napirawa in her book states that religions have the potential to divide citizens and nations. She also stresses that since religions may be exploited or abused in a way that sharpens social conflicts, it is a great responsibility on part of religious leaders and politicians who should abstain from exploiting religions to some partisan short-term goals. And this is exactly the issue I would like to examine, particularly taking into account the constitutional perspective and the role judicial review has played in this regard. In 2012, constitutional scholars discussing the freedom of religion wrote that Religious beliefs and practices have the potential to disrupt the political order as they might lead one to disobedience, resistance and martyrdom. Religious fundamentalism is inclined to authoritarianism with important consequences for contemporary democracy. And this was written right before the illiberal upsurge, just six years later, in another constitutional compendium, the tone was more ominous. Ran Herschel and Ayelet Shahar wrote in 2018 that religion is back with a vengeance. There's an evident alliance between religious infused markers of identity and the current populist nationalist assault on constitutional democracy. We could see in the US, in Turkey, in Poland, in Hungary and so on, how religion was used as a voter magnet. Michael Luo of New Yorker magazine wrote that one of the most jarring scenes of the capital invasion on January 6, 2021, was the prayer of the rioters in the Senate chamber. The data suggest a faith-based reality divide emerging within the Republican Party. Other surveys have found that white evangelicals are much more skeptical of the COVID-19 vaccine and are less likely than other Americans to get it, potentially jeopardizing the country's recovery from the pandemic. The faith-based reality divide is of crucial importance since it endangers the possibility of maintaining the cohesion of the democratic society. Ren Hirsch and Ayala Shahar identified four frontiers of the clash between religion and constitutionalism. The one that I find the most important is the structural source of clash between religion and the constitutional domain. Both religion and constitutionalism represent competing governing orders. In most consti constitutional democracies, the role formally granted to religion is supplanted by the constitutional order. So all in all, we have two governance orders religious versus constitutional, and two realities, issues like women's rights, control of epidemics, school curricula, but also foreign policy and voting rights, and most of all, climate crisis, may look and do look 
entirely different in these two separate dimensions. Therefore, essential issues are at stake. There are four important periods during which religious passions were exploited or harnessed in the American constitutional practice. The Trump era. The affinity between the self-proclaimed value voter and Donald Trump attracted significant attention in recent years. On the surface, it seemed very confusing. Keen observers, however, argue convincingly that white evangelicals' support for Trump was not an aberration and that it wasn't even a pragmatic deal. Christine Cobert Dumais devoted her whole book to showing that this support for Trump was the culmination of evangelicals' embrace of militant masculinity. 1970s and 1980s, as Stephen Tallis depicts it, around the 1960s, liberal reformers transformed the American political system. The new policy process put a premium on knowledge, expertise, and professional credentials, and developed in tandem with the legalization of society. The political system became increasingly sensitive to expert opinions, issue framing, and professional networks, whereas elections became decreasingly important as sources of large-scale policy change. In the 1970s and 1980s, conservative Republicans were at a severe disadvantage in these areas. Therefore, it could not have come as a surprise that in the 1970s, when the Republican Party faced a crisis with Nixon forced out of office, an attempt was made to form a coalition between the Republican Party and conservative Christians, which could provide a new constituency and some potentially powerful networks. Conservative political operatives like Paul Weyrich convinced evangelical and conservative Protestant leaders such as Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson to enter politics, having met many of them and learned of their political anxieties. And we know that the official story that Christians reacted to blasphemous Supreme Court decisions like Roe v. Wade, which legalized abortion, is not true. The matter that really pushed the evangelicals to enter politics was a need to maintain racial segregation. Let's make another step backward, roughly to 1950s. Much has been said and written about the religious revival of the Eisenhower era against the background of Cold War anxieties. However, Kevin Cruz has brilliantly shown in his book that the post-war revolution in America's religious identity had its roots not in the foreign policy panic of the 1950s, but rather in the domestic politics of the 1930s and early 1940s. Corporate titans enlisted conservative clergymen in an effort to defeat the state power that these men feared most. And it wasn't the Soviet regime in Moscow, but Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal administration in Washington. In many ways, Christian America was invented by corporate America. The post-Civil War era was the foundational period, most distant in time, but ideologically not so much. Right after the defeat of Confederacy, Edward Pollard published his very influential book, The Lost Cause, in which he asserted that the defeat had not made all our sacred things profane and that the Southern people were going to cling to and still claim things which the war had not decided 
like Negro equality and Negro suffrage. A year later, in The Lost Cause Regained, Pollard emphasized religious overtones, prophesizing that the South must wear the crown of thorns before she can assume that of victory. Not only the whole religion of the lost cause was created, but also, argues Robert P. Jones, the Southern Baptist Convention, powerful in its role as a religious institution that sacralized white supremacy, dominated the Southern culture and ultimately evolved into the single largest Christian denomination in the country, setting the tone for American Christianity overall and Christianity's influence in public life. It was just a cursory glance on these four periods, but I'd like to point out that there are two common features of them. The first one that probably stands out is the racist basis. Even during the New Deal era, this was an important factor. In the three other periods, there was a strong undercurrent of racism and white supremacy hidden behind religious talk. In all four of these eras, there was also another common feature, the fact that the Supreme Court engaged in these power struggles and that the court served as a proxy venue, a substitute arena for political battles. During the New Deal Revolution, the Roosevelt administration faced a hostile court and responded with a considerable pressure campaign that forced the court to practically withdraw from reviewing economic regulations. When business tycoons lost the support of the court, they started forging an alliance with the religious right. In the 1960s and 1970s, religious conservatives put a lot of blame on the Supreme Court for what they perceived as a moral decline of America. The Supreme Court is always at the forefront of the minds of those on the Christian right because it is seen as the place where far-reaching decisions are made. The most interesting and arguably the most obscure intersection between the Supreme Court's actions and conservative cultural sensibilities, as well as needs that nowadays are associated with the Christian right, happened in the post-Civil War era. In 1883, the court decided that the Civil Rights Act of 1875 was unconstitutional. I strongly argue that this was the real beginning of the American Judicial Review. It was the first time that a significant federal law was invalidated by the court and it was not met with retribution by political authorities. The court eviscerated the Reconstruction Amendments and changed their meaning by removing the anti-racist content, thus paving the way for Jim Crow laws. Instead, the court decided that it was the moneyed class which was to be protected under the 14th Amendment. Half a century later, this led the court to the clash with the New Deal administration. Why justices of the Supreme Court felt empowered to invalidate an important federal statute for the first time and then for many decades diligently stifled efforts for racial justice? Because Democrats regained control of the House of Representatives and sentiments of white supremacy prevailed nationwide, backed by religious teaching. These historical observations allow me to expand on the idea that the Christian right and its ancestors and the Supreme Court 
found themselves in a symbiotic relationship or partnership. The court always needed support of political elites, or at least of a popular national majority. Otherwise, the court's decisions were ignored. The court's jurisdiction over certain classes of cases was under threat. Law professors ridiculed justice's legal reasoning and so forth. In the 19th century, the support for the court flowed mostly from the national government, which was interested in securing and expanding the federal scope of authority. Obviously, I am painting here with a broad brush. In the second half of the 19th century, the court emphatically supported white supremacy, thus gaining political capital. As a matter of fact, after the Reconstruction, the court put into practice the South's white supremacy agenda consolidated by religious rhetoric. And in this way, the jurisprudence of the court contributed to the fact that the South had not lost a civil war in a cultural dimension. When the New Deal coalition forced the Supreme Court to retreat from the doctrines of economic due process, the court tried to reinvent itself and declared in a famous footnote 4 to the Caroline Products decision of 1938 that it would become the guardian of the democratic process and the protector of minority rights. This stance combined with the Cold War imperative and social upheavals of the long 60s led to a string of decisions issued by the Supreme Court under Chief Justice Earl Warren that shook the foundations of the cultural identity of conservative Christians. These were the decisions that dealt with black Americans' rights, women's rights, and the public role of re religion. Along the way, a significant development took place in 1967. President Johnson nominated Thurgood Marshall as the first black Supreme Court Justice. As Laura Kalman has demonstrated, this was a pivotal moment. Southern conservative senators used Thurgood Marshall's nomination to turn the Warren Court into a boogeyman, an evil spirit. Thurgood Marshall became public enemy number one in the South, but Southern segregationists became history's losers, and they dared not criticize the famous school desegregation case, Brown v. Board of Education. Black Americans in the South finally gained voting rights thanks to the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So the Southern segregationists turned to dock whistle politics. They sent coded messages to white voters while trying to appeal to black voters. Thurgood Marshall's opponents in the Senate decided to showcase contempt for the Warren Court. Now, white supremacy morphed into disdain for the Warren Court and enthusiasm for law and order, though the transformation preserved the underlying racism, writes Laura Kalma. This is how the relationship between the ascending Christian right and the court developed and strengthened. At first, the court became the usual suspect and the easy target for fundamentalists who couldn't and wouldn't adapt to rapid social changes. The criticism centered on the so-called activist court was a convenient way of expressing white grievance because it sounded civilized enough to let the critics remain in mainstream politics. The takeover of the Southern Baptist Convention in 1979 by fundamentalists proved 
putting the right people in the right positions may effectively change the doctrine. The Supreme Court is the apex, the top of the pyramid, not only of the judicial structure, but also, and more important, importantly, of the support structure pyramid that Amanda Hollis Brasky and Joshua C. Wilson discuss thoroughly. The conservative Christian legal movement wants to transform the law and legal culture. Such an endeavor requires building a whole support structure with a base, which provides funding and, and general patronage. The first level, law schools and legal training programs, providing human, social, cultural, and intellectual capital. The second level, lawyers and public interest law organizations, providing litigation that includes high and low profile legal actions. And the third level, courts which decide cases born and influenced through the combined efforts of level one and two actors. And there is also another factor which needs to be considered. These legal struggles are in many ways a substitute arena for electoral politics. Conservative Christians are a stable and considerable constituency, but they do not comprise a majority of voters. Therefore, politicians, especially Republicans, had to develop a strategy. David Domke and Kevin Coe explained that this is the God strategy, an attempt to attract religious conservatives without alienating moderate Americans by calculated and partisan use of faith. The Supreme Court may serve, in my view, as an extension of the God strategy, which is particularly useful for the Republican Party elites and its donors. The court is a venue where certain problems inconvenient for politicians may be transferred to. I am following Keith Whittington here, who insightfully argues that political actors commonly defer to judges and even seek to bolster their authority because it is useful to them. And one of the reasons is the fact that a coalition leader has to protect individual legislators and the coalition as a whole from having to take clear positions on politically risky issues independent and active judicial review generates position-taking opportunities by reducing the policy responsibility of the elected official. This abstract description by Keith Whittington fits well with the God strategy and the theme of my paper. It has been far more safe for politicians to direct attention of the Christian right to the Supreme Court in a long-term strategy of retaining the electoral support of religious voters. It has been far more safe to avoid responsibility for legislative and executive acts that would be unpopular with the non-fundamentalist voters. This leads me to make three final points concerning the possible jurisprudential effect of the symbiotic relation between the Christian right and the Supreme Court. First, both sides of this association have a lot to gain from it. The Supreme Court deals with complex and risky religious issues, thus eases the burden for politicians. This usefulness of the court in religious affairs enhances its legitimacy and reduces the need of disarming justices of the court of their interpretive authority. Religious litigants may also find it attractive to litigate. As a matter of fact, investing resources in litigation-based movements 
could be a win-win situation. Some victories may be achieved that would be hard to secure in elections. The length of the proceedings and the ability to produce case after case help to excite followers' attention in this long game. Even defeats may be beneficial. They excite followers even more and encourage the sense of embattlement. Another important issue is the one that can be drawn from Anna Gmała Busse insight. The most influential churches gain direct institutional access to policy making, essentially sharing sovereignty with secular governments. I would suggest that the Supreme Court could be regarded as arguably the most precious channel of direct or at least semi-direct institutional access. The influence exerted by religious groups through the Supreme Court may be internal and external. The internal influence may be exerted by securing appointments of justices sympathetic to the cause of family values, sanctity of life, traditional morality and so forth. The external influence may be exercised by providing the court with cases, arguments and ideas in order to move the law and its enforcement into a desirable direction. And this is why the conservative Christian legal movement invests so much into the aforementioned support structure pyramid. And there is also a connection with my previous argument lower levels of this pyramid like notre dame law school or liberty council supply cases arguments and ideas to courts particularly to the supreme court this strengthens the usefulness of the court in dealing with these matters otherwise legislative bodies would have to solve this problem it is then sort of a legal perpetual motion machine. Legal claims and challenges made by conservative Christian legal movement provoke judicial responses, which trigger another set of claims and challenges. My final point regarding the Supreme Court is that we should consider some unintended consequences of infusing the legal system with ideas coming from groups or communities who use legal claims and challenges to express their commitment to an illiberal social order based on hierarchies and exclusiveness. Bad doctrines tend to persist in law and can be used to oppress vulnerable groups. Particular attention should be given to a doctrine of religious exemptions. Claims that some legal rules violate the right to free exercise of religion were raised for decades by religious individuals, and claimants demanded exemptions from these regulations. Religious conservatives were handed some important victories in the Supreme Court in recent years. In decisions like Hobby Lobby and Little Sisters, the court granted major religious exemptions for conservative Christians and departed from the previous approach that protected third parties. And this is what is particularly troubling about this expansion of religious exemptions. They cause harm to third parties who interact with religious individuals and corporations. In the Little Sisters case, the government and religious objectors flatly rejected compromise and asked the court to bow entirely to religious interests at the expense of employees. The court yielded to this position, whereas a pluralistic society depends for its survival 
on balancing competing interests. And this is precisely the tension referred to above, the clash between competing governance orders by giving preference to religious objectors motivated by animosity toward secular modernity, the Supreme Court risks undermining the constitutional order. Thank you.